Okay, so the reason why this is important, I think, for us as translation people is because it gives us the possibility of talking about one very important group which we have neglected for a very long time without having to do as if they are an exception. That is deaf people. Because if we continue with this language or language thing, and we continue to be focused, the hegemony, hegemony of, 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 of spoken language is going to dominate everything we do. But if we realize that we talk about sign systems, then of course sign language is a language of communication. And of course it's a system that has the same intricacies. It's just different from spoken language, you know? And, and you see people struggling to define sign language, <laughs> you know, in terms of spoken language. And we're always comparing, we're always trying to define, but maybe we just need to admit that the human being is more complex than that. Um, so I'm going to jump over this because this is not, uh, so, so we're talking about um, embodiment as an umbrella, we're thinking about neuroscience where we are told that the human brain functions in a way of imitation, there's uh, neurons will fire off, while you're seeing me move, neurons in your brain are firing off, the exact neurons that move your hands are firing off, although you're not moving your hands but you're imitating <laughs> without knowing. The human brain, apparently, the human being has this capacity or, or this need, this intrinsic need to mimic the other human being. You know, we see it with children, we see it with language, we mimic. Uh, Girard talked about the mimetic human being. In social anthropology, a lot is said about that. So the, the thing that, that uh, sem semiotics says, actually, is the fact that since human beings speak is not the right word in this case, but human beings make meaning through sign systems, make meaning, it might be better than what you said, um, we will find ways to do it. We will find ways to do it. Um, so it doesn't really, um, if we can do it through, through, through clothing, if we can do it through our face, if we can do it through language, through spoken language, <laughs> they can do it through sign system, we will find ways to communicate. Some are more, more intricate, each sign system has its own, its own reality. Each sign system has its own um, genius. But there's a democracy of sign systems, as mutations say. So, so why would writing be more important than oral? Because of history because of powers that be, because of social cultural history, that's why writing has been hegemonized. Remember that Plato said, that Socrates said, watch out with writing. Socrates said, writing is a very dangerous thing because it robs you of your memory. So Socrates, the philosopher, as Plato tells us, was very skeptical of writing. <laughs> And it's not for nothing that the great leaders of ancient times didn't write themselves, but others wrote for them. Because writing wasn't hegemonized as something, as, as an elite thing. I mean, of course, you had the scribes, but the scribes wrote for the kings. The kings often couldn't read or write themselves. It was just a, a, a something you do, some, you know, um, an, a skill. And then it became tied to the temple, of course, and to the to archives of the king. So it starts becoming important. Um, Jesus didn't leave anything written. <laughs> Socrates didn't leave anything written. <laughs> so, so it's very interesting. If you look at the Greco-Roman history too, you see that a lot of the, the great philosophers, a lot of them wrote, but some of them even tell us that they don't write themselves. One of them even tells us, so when I go home, I'm gonna tell my slave to write this for me. <laughs> when I tell my slave <laughs> to write this down for me because the master himself couldn't write, but he was asking the slave was, I had the skill to write. So let's do a little exercise where we're going to read these two sentences and we're going to be reading them we're going to be reading them a couple of times. We're going to start with uh, Luis. We're going to go. And the idea here is to try to read them whatever way you want to read them. Um, if you want to use your hands, you can use your hands. If you want to use an intonation, use certain intonation. Whatever way you think comes to your mind to read this. Okay? So 
So we're going to do it a couple of times because the more you do it, the more you realize that you want to be a little creative with it. So, so I'm going to start and then Luis can continue. In the beginning, God created the heavens. No, I'm going to read the whole, the whole thing. God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. <laughs> you were saying English, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In the beginning, God creates the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and the darkness was upon the face of the deep. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. And that place was up in the face of the deep. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and white, and that was upon the face of the deep. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Miles, whoever wants to continue. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. The earth who worked out form and void, and darkness were upon the face of the death. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the In the beginning, God created heavens and earth. The earth was without form and form. And darkness was upon the face of the dead. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was with a form in white, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But the earth was void, without form. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. Continue. Just let, let, it, let it flow, let it flow. Continue. Next, after one after the other. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, back. I don't know why it's. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. The earth was without form. The darkness was often the place of the In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form, everyone. And the darkness was upon the face of the deep. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. In the beginning, the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Yeah. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and darkness and the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the earth. No, doesn't matter if you change the text. Just go ahead. If you change the text, it's okay. Go. <laughs> In the beginning, God created heaven, heaven and earth. The earth was without form. And the darkness was upon the face of the day. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and white. <laughs> good, 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 good. <laughs> yeah, good, good. <laughs> very good, very good. So go ahead, go ahead, continue, continue. Yeah. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was the form of void and the darkness was on the face of the deep. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Darkness was upon the face of the 
<laughs> in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was void with a form and darkness was over the face of the deep. So, you see, the whole passage changes meaning depending on how you read it and what kind of body language you do. The dominant body language and tone here is the one from the church. <laughs> Isn't it? I mean, it's what we are used to. It's a holy text, so we're going to read it in a certain way. But imagine somebody who doesn't know the passage. Remember somebody who's thinking, what kind of creation is this anyway? In the beginning, God creates the heaven and the earth. You think it's going to be a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> but then, the earth is void. What kind of, what kind of uh, job is this? <laughs> so, so either the second sentence is explaining, or the second sentence might be accusing God, or the second might be quizzical. How, how, how is this possible? Or even a surprise, you know. Thank you. Uh, give yourself a clap. Very good. Now, I would suggest to you to think that each reading was a performance. And each reading, in a certain sense, was a translation. Because if you, in your intonation, is skeptical or sarcastic, you can use the same words and you're giving them another meaning. Instead of it being a revelation, a good thing, you can make it sound as if it's actually not such a good thing. <laughs> um, you can make it sound as if there's some doubts about this. You can make it sound also as if people say that, you know. Some people say that, but I don't know if that's true or not. So if each reading was kind of a performance and some people performed it bodily also, with, and you look at the gestures and the hand gestures, um, the question is, what is the original? What is the original? I'm asking you, what was the original? The diversity of readings, what does that mean? What does, what does that mean for the original? Let me put it that way. Is that an original? Let me ask first. I don't think too deep. <laughs> You're suggesting perhaps that there wasn't an original. No, no, I'm not suggesting anything. I'm asking. But I'm saying this doesn't necessarily mean that there wasn't. No. Uh, you are assuming a lot of things about me. <laughs> No, see, see. So, so you're saying it doesn't mean that there wasn't an original. Yeah, yeah. So my question was, where is the original? What is the original? But, but why are you guys, you don't want to answer what? <laughs> because you think, you think it's a trick question. <laughs> well, well, well I, think, I think the, mo the most basic answer would be the original is there. Because we are all looking at that text. Okay, so the so so <laughs> but but my so 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 it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. So so in semiotics, semiotic sign system, every sign points to the other sign. So what you were doing, I'm I'm thinking you're doing this. Of course, I'm noticing you're interpreting in a different ways than maybe I am, or it becomes its own different sign now because you're doing it for an exercise. Um, so there is this whole discussion about the original, isn't there? And, <laughs> and Miles kind of uh, viscerally reacted to, <laughs> to that whole issue. Um, so we see, so let, let's go back here. Is this the original? We can say first say yes, and then we can say no. Why would we say no? The original is in Hebrew. The original is in Hebrew. That original in Hebrew, where do we find it? In the BHS. In the BHS. <laughs> very good, very good. Thank you, thank you, Claire. You're helping me out. <laughs> in the BHS. Now I go to the BHS. Is that in the BHS the original? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's in the Codex Lindigandensis. <laughs> so I go there. Is that the original? 
Okay, so okay, so we have a manuscript tradition. You know, okay, so, so what semiotics says is that you can always continue to go back and back and back and back with science systems, not only with this, but even with the word that we use. Say the word apple. It's science to something, science to something. There's a whole system. Now, many people, no, 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 I'm going to get you. Many people have missed you, and, and that's why I liked, I liked <laughs> my, my visceral reaction. Ma many people have used this to say, well, there's no original. But philosophically, this is not what the semioticians are saying. Okay, they are saying there's no original in the sense that ontologically, in essence, in its being, systems always keep, the science system is unending. Because whatever you do, whatever you say, you can continue to point to something else. You know, you can continue to point to a sign that points to a sign, and then you use an abstract word, points to an abstract word, so you can continue. But in order for there to be translation, performance, and communication, I need to assume an original. The, the, the only way I'm going to be able to talk about what you all did, if, if, I, if I go back here, Let's say I didn't have this. Let's say I don't have it. I only heard what you did. In hearing what you did, although it was diverse, some people changed text a little bit, some people try to keep, let's say I'm, I'm not seeing this. I'm somewhere else and I'm just hearing you. I don't know your, your reading. I will notice by some of you that you're reading because you correct yourself. I know that some of you are a little more free with the, with what the text. I can kind of reconstruct kind of an original. And say, okay, this is the text they're trying to do. Yeah, I can even maybe reconstruct. It comes from a, 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 a formal equivalent translation, <laughs> uh, the face of the deep and stuff like that. So I can I can reconstruct a lot about your translations about the original that. Although you don't have the exact original in your mind, you have a lot in common about what you think. That, I think, is the problem with saying there's no original. There's always an assumed original. Otherwise, you can, there's no correspondence. So, so we, we talk about the Bible and we say, well, we always say, well, the, the Bible in the original languages. We don't want to say the original text because we don't want to confuse people to think that we do have the original manuscript, eh? the, the, the first, uh, the autograph. But in one sense, we are right to say that there's no original. In another sense, human beings will always assume an original. That's why churches assume an original. When they get their Bible, they assume it's either an original or it's a sign of another pseudo-original. So they assume, well, King James maybe, or they assume the traditional translation, or when they know they translated from the Greek, they assume there's something out there <laughs> that makes you do this thing you're doing here. So I think that's very important to reconstruct. Telling people in translation there's no original, it's not helpful because it's a philosophical, epistemological, semiotic thing when you say there's no original. That's true, it's true, it's true. Epistemologically, philosophically. But in the practice of communication, I'm always assuming an original. When Miles talks to me, he talks to me about something in Canada, I'm not there. How can I con talk, continue the conversation with him if, I, if there's no cutting off point? <laughs> he tells me, see. Say, what does Miles mean by the word see? So, <laughs> well, he can point here <laughs> to the sea. What is his image of the sea? What does sea con connotate for him? I can continue to, to dig, to dig, to dig, but for some reason we are communicating. Even though I don't share all of the connotations of the word sea with him, even though there's a lot of his original that I don't, <laughs> I don't have access to, we're still able to communicate. Oh, you had a question. You had a question or a comment, I think. No, I haven't. Time ago. Uh... Maybe from the context of uh, textual criticism, mm -hmm. we, we talk of originality in terms of the text as uh, still accessible, but the original manuscript yeah. as uh, no longer. Yeah, yeah. The, the autograph, we cannot get to them. Yeah. yeah. The original text yeah. have been transmitted through the copies. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so you always have that problem. And, and, and maybe there's always this constructed original. Now, we have an ideal. At least to be able to talk. Otherwise, otherwise, how can I evaluate your translation if there is no correspondence? So, so you, you translated a poem. See, there's no original. So how can I tell you, how do I know you did a good job or not? How do, do I know if you tell me you're doing it for children? Well, there was a good translation for children you did. I need to have some original, some correspondent text that I'm saying, okay, you are moving from here to here. And then I can say, oh, you have done this process, this process, might agree with you, might not agree with you, but there must be something there. Otherwise, there must be something assumed. That's why when we say that churches like to attach themselves to a translation, uh, King James, Sir Vaughan, Lena Valera, Almeida, that's why when we, when we kind of say, well, you know, why, why are they doing that? That's the history of Judeo-Christianity. I mean, the Septuaginta was also considered to be a good original text in Alexandria, I would imagine. <laughs> I mean, everybody who has one of the manuscripts reading in his church would consider it to be a good original. So, so we all do this. We all do this. Yeah. I was going to say that the, um, the fact of pseudo-translations. Oh, yeah. That's the difference where you present something as a translation. It's not, in fact, a translation. There is no source text. But the audience... Believes it to be a translation because of the way Yes, so so you're using the notion of a pseudo original, the audience have in their mind. It's like with all the revisions that we do of uh, well, Segon is different, but but like well let me talk about Rene Balera because that's the one I know. Um, or even King James. You look at King James, all the new King James versions that are coming out, and Rene Valera, they keep revising it. Well, sometimes I show people the first Rene Valera, one of the first the facsimile. I said try to read it. Can read it, but they want the Reina Valera, <laughs> and 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 that's why in Spanish you have 30, 30 revisions of the Reina Valera, and all carry the name Reina Valera, Reina Valera Repisada, Reina Valera Actualizada, Reina Valera Contemporánea, Reina Valera de Estudio, because the name continues to perpetuate and confirms the idea of the pseudo original. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes uh, original is a privilege because of the perceived authority inherent on uh, yeah. On the yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The authority, of course, is imputed by the audience or by the community, not necessarily yes. the yes. thing. Yes, 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 yes. So, so the thing is that human beings will always communicate through signs, that Bible is not just, that Bible means something to some people in different contexts. <laughs> yeah? So to some it might just mean, I'm reading the word of God, so I'm reading what happened in those days, but it has acquired another meaning. How many times don't we hear people say, I don't understand much of it, but it sounds good. Because there, the criteria of, of iconicity, I'm going to talk about iconicity, the criteria of, 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 of what I expect for a translation within that social context of liturgy is the sound is more important, the rhythm is more important. How many people say, well, King James or Reina Valera or Almeida in Portuguese, it sounds good. I mean, I'm used to it. I, you know, it, it, it just sounds beautiful, you know? I mean, li literally, sometimes you ask people, say, it, say it's beautiful. And then you say, what, 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 does, what does it say here? I don't know. <laughs> but it sounds, but there's a sound to it. Of course, they know more than, they don't know that part, but they know the rest. But once we, we, we have accepted, once we have prioritized what is important in our scale of meaning, other things we can do without. So, so if, if the sound is important to me, if poetry for me is sound, if the liturgy is, I don't mind not understanding every word <laughs> because it's helping me create meaning within the liturgical setting. So I don't mind. Yeah. So I just want to tease Sure. One thing apart. Yes. So, yes. Thank you. <laughs> Do that. When Saussure so talked about signs, he didn't, it was not Saussure so that said, well, you know, this sign points to that sign and that points to that, and you never end. 
No. So, so, no, so, no. I wasn't talking about Susu when I said that. That, that is the Amidah. No, no, yeah. And no, that's the other simulations. So yeah. this, so, no. so but this vertiginous signs pointing to signs and never arriving anywhere yeah. is actually a very specific Line in the audience. Yeah, and but but most people would say that is the dominant. Uh, per Perse was the first one to say it. Actually, Plato said it already. Uh, uh, so Sur didn't say it. So I wasn't saying Professor Sur said it. I was just continuing to talk about semiotics in general. I'm not so Sur didn't say it. No, but in semiotics, it's kind of generally cognitively too. It's kind of generally agreed that it's very difficult, epistemologically at least, to get behind the final sign. You know what I'm saying? Um, um, there's always a point. Thing. Whatever way you do it, you, you'll end up with saying, well, I don't know exactly why you're comparing it, but you're comparing it to something. It's like a, what they call the, the semiotic chain. You know, I mean, in that article, Hudson talks about it, but it, 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 a lot of simulations talk, talk about it. But it's true that Saussure didn't say it. It's kind of a development after Saussure, which... Um, Did you say that? Per said it, yeah. Yeah, per se, literally. Before Derrida. Because Before Derrida. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, for, for some people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, per, per, per se, before. And as a matter of fact, a lot of other people said it in different ways. But Derrida, of course, made it. And Derrida, I don't know if you read Purse, but the, that, there's a lot of, I don't think he did. But, but actually, it's not such a strange conclusion to reach if you think about it. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. But true, I wasn't, so Stuart didn't say it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so why should we study semiotics to do translation? Why would semiotics help us with embodied performance? Um, well, this is just a funny thing. This is a pressing question in part because the writers of semioticians have a reputation for being dense with jargon. One critic wittily remarked that semiotics tells us things we already know in a language we will never understand. So that's, <laughs> so that's always the danger of all these theories that they're, what I call the, the, the cannonball mosquito effect. So big cannonball is used to kill one little mosquito. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so sometimes it's a jargon in them. Um, in my own search, um, in my own search for finding that brand of semiotics <laughs> that I think is helpful, I have shared with you on canvas. I've come across these guys from Australia, Dutch Australia, who I think are onto something in the fact that okay, you have different schools of semiotics, so we're not going to get into that. <laughs> I mean, in the, I'll share the PowerPoint with you and you'll find the different slides about that. Uh, you have the Prague school, you have the Italian school, you have the French school, of course, you have different schools. So. Um, but the point I want to make just now is, first, we always need to give credit to Ferdinand Saussure because in a way, he was the father of linguistics, but in a sense, he's also the co-father. If you take Peirce, he and Peirce didn't know each other and about, not the same time, but they kind of came up with a different system, but actually saying some things that are similar. The only thing is that Peirce was more, more geared towards science systems in general, and Saussure kind of focused a lot on language. But, but the mistake that people make is to think that Saussure was only talking about language. Actually, he was talking about language, but he wanted to get at the meaning of science, science system. And because language is such an elaborate science system, that was the best way to start, you know? Um, so let's talk about science a little bit. Mm. Let's talk about science a little bit. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna be doing it quick, but I just, so normally when we talk about science, I'm gonna be simplifying <laughs> a little bit here. But one of the things that, that Saussure pointed out was when we talk about, so we have, we have a word that refers to something. So I say tree, and then you look outside, I say there's a tree there, and then the word tree refers to the thing out there. So there's a combination of the signifier and the signified. Um, that is the way language works. That's the way a lot of things work, you know? Um, the color red, means something in many places. So in some countries, you, you don't put your Bible in red because it's the color of communism or it's the color of, uh, in some, some situations, the color of love. 
<laughs> Another situation is the blood of Jesus. <laughs> Another, so, so the same color has different meanings because human beings give meanings to not only to words, we use words to express meaning, but everything gets their meaning. So this, this way of looking at how we speak and what we do, so a word signifies something because I'm linking it to something out there. Um, afterwards, people develop it a little bit further and said, well, you know, when I say dog, when I say dog, I mean a dog out there. It's not that your brain connects it immediately to that dog. Your brain connects it to your notion of dogness. You have a certain notion of what the dog is. And then when I say that word in English, you connect it first to that concept in your mind. And because you have that concept in your mind, that's why you connect it to that thing outside. So this is the famous person triad. He's not the first person to say it. He's the first person to say it in that way. Um, actually, Plato said it already <laughs> in different words. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a triad. It's not just one-to-one -one correspondence. So if I say mother, we all know who a mother is. Do we all know who a mother is? It depends on our culture. So I say mother, generally we all know. But when we go, we go deeper, we find connotations, you know? And, and for the one, there's cultural connotations. Um, there are um, personal connotations, <laughs> you know? Um, father, mother, all those terms. So there's more going on than just one-to-one -one correspondence. This is important in Bible translation. This is important in the active fact of Bible translation because we always want to know, that's why when we translate, we're using one word, but that word never directly refers to that one thing in the Bible. There is a mediation in that person's mind. That's why we want to know. In your culture, what does mother mean? How do you use the word mother or the word, word sister? If a culture doesn't have a word for cousin, for cousins, but uses brother. It's a different way of thinking, like, like the biblical cards of, cards of the Bible, you know. So it's a different way of thinking. So, so we try to find out what is in that mind <laughs> so that we can translate, recreate to the best that we can something that approximates <laughs> what is in the assumed original. I'm not gonna go very deep into this, I just want you to be aware of this. So, so for semiotics, signs are important. Signs refer to, let's put it that way, things outside, but actually signs refer more to my, my concepts that I have. So that is why we say often, like in paratext, just to make it very practical, one, one of the critiques has been, of different consultants has been, well, Paratext tells you to talk about um, um, key terms, which in many languages can mean certain words. And some people have said, well, we should talk about key concepts, a higher level. Because it's not that one term that I'm trying to do. It's a whole network of concepts that I'm trying to get at, okay? Okay. Um, I'm gonna jump over this, jump over this too, and I'm gonna reach here. <laughs> so, first define three types, three types of signs. He talked about iconic signs. Iconic signs, you can see some examples here. Iconic signs, you can kind of, there is a mirroring of the reality in the sign. So this is more or less a human being. It's a woman, sorry. This is also a human being, a man. It's somebody in a wheelchair. So there is some iconicity, you know. Um, apple symbol. We can kind of recognize an apple. So iconicity means that I'm kind of trying to reflect the reality of that thing in the sign. There's something there, there's an iconicity. Um, give me, give me, give me I iconic, iconic words in spoken language. Um, what would be like? I mean, you go down the office in Ireland, maybe uh, Xeroxes. That's generic. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But so, so, so iconicity is, for example, a picture. A, take a picture. 
that's a sign of you. But it's icon, it's because it's a, it's a, it, it's you. It resembles you, a, a drawing. But but in, in spoken language now, give me an example of iconic. Yeah. Oops. <laughs> or what does a, what does a, 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 a hen do in your in your language? What does a chicken do? In English? No, 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 no. <laughs> That's a good one. Yeah, across the road. What, what, what sound does a chicken make? <laughs> okay, who did it? Okay, okay. What does a chicken do in other. Uh, uh, do it, do it. Perform. Well, performance thing, you guys. Performance. Yeah? You see, all chicken sounds different. Cocorico, cocorico, cocolico, cocolico, cocolico. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, I stood at the cock. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I'm getting confused with my chickens. <laughs> yeah, my chickens confused. <laughs> but, but I have a long discussion. For example, what, what does a cow do in English? Since we are speaking English here, I mean, what? The, uh, don't tell me across the road, okay? <laughs> Moon. What? Let me see if I any, any German speaker here. Anybody German? No. What? German speaker here. Somebody speaks German? No. Okay. Um, what does? Uh, <laughs> you see, in Dutch and German, Germanic and other German languages, the, the the cow does not do moo. The cow goes boo. Not me. <laughs> no, and if you ask somebody, if you ask somebody in the street, you say, "What does a cow do?" And they say, "It goes boo." And you tell them, "I've done it in Latin America. This is a big joke in, in, in workshops. I tell people, what does a cow do in Spanish?'" So everybody goes moo, and I say, "That's not true." In my language, Papiamento, because of Dutch influence, and in Dutch, it goes boo, and you actually hear him go boo. <laughs> <laughs> no, because, because your brain, because that, that, that onomatopoeic um, use is iconic, but it's iconic to the degree that there's something internalized through culture that makes you even hear in a different way. It's very interesting when you ask people what, animals, what sound animals make. And many people have never thought that in another language, the onomatopoeic sound for the animal is totally different from theirs. They think, what? Those people don't hear well. <laughs> those, those people. <laughs> so, so even the onomatopoeic sound that we think is a, a, a thing set in stone, it's a sign. It's just a sign. It's a sign that we are used to. It's a sign that in our language functions. But in another language, we have to translate it. So if you're translating a children's book and the cow in the children's book go moo in English, if you're doing it in Dutch, the cow has to say boo. Otherwise, it's a strange cow or a cow with speech impediment. <laughs> okay, then you, have, then you have indexical signs. Indexical signs are a little difficult to explain sometimes, but it's a sign where the actual, the actual um, cause of the sign is directly... Um, so, so here... Here, iconic, you can see the human being, you can see the apple. Here is the imprint that is left. So, so indexical sign. For example, in language, the uh, deictic, deictic words are, are indexical. Um, here only has meaning here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, 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 I'm, I'm putting this here. It only has actually meaning here in this room. Because when I go, I tell somebody else, I say, I talk to my wife, I say, yes, I'm telling the people I'm putting the bag here. It doesn't mean anything to you. Where, where is here? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a, there is a direct link to you need to, you know? So this guy, I'm going to give you more examples of this. So the handprint. We're going to come back to this. And then example of symbolic signs. So symbolic signs, we know this is a Greek convention. This is what Saussure, Saussure uh, emphasized about spoken language. It's arbitrary in a sense. A lot of signs are arbitrary. The genius of Peirce is to say, well, not all signs are the same. <laughs> And, and there's a difference between symbolic signs and these other two, you know. But spoken language, or let's say traffic. For example, this here, what does it mean? 
Does it mean run as fast as you can? Does it mean now it's time to cross the street? Emergency exit. Emergency exit? <laughs> you know, so it's something you need, you need to know. And sometimes you visit countries. For example, I don't know what this sign, what does this sign mean with the glasses? I, I don't know what it means. Scuba diving. So you, <laughs> oh, oh, maybe you can. <laughs> I don't know. These, are, these you need to you need to know. You need to, you need to know. It's a convention. We know this means not. We know often the red and the circle is a prohibition. You know, in many in many traffic signs, and so we kind of know this is a cigarette. But you've never seen a cigarette before. <laughs> I mean, you don't really know what it is. You know, it doesn't say anything. Yeah, but you might, if, the way that you represented the humans there too, some, you might, some people might not recognize those either. That's very... I'm, I'm going to come to that because that's the problem with Bible translation too. So when we think something is, even, even something that's iconic, yeah. like the onomatopoeic, that's, that's another example, but this, this is an example too. It, it's onomatopoeic, it's iconic in a sense, but in another sense, you can debate because there is also a cultural element in it. Yeah, yeah. But still, I think it works. Yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Because for example, this one here, if you've never seen somebody in a wheelchair before, you don't know, is it a half human being, half bicycle person? You don't, you don't, you don't, if you never, you don't know, you don't have any reference. Okay, so, um, so the best thing to remember, remember iconic is a picture of you is iconic. That, that's the easiest, no? That's iconic, no? Um, I think that we won't, we won't. Uh, but in language, in spoken language, we can have iconic, we have iconic words, onomatopoeia, but we talked about, for example, Julia Charles grabbed that carrot and went chop, 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 chop. So that is also, no? Um, but there's other ways too to be, to be iconic. So we say, uh, uh, poor widow baby. So we, we lengthen the vowels when we want to express something. If you're talking to a child, you want to have a, like a baby voice, we heighten our tone, we lengthen the vowels, we put the stress differently. We are being iconic of something. There's something iconic about it. That's what, uh, so, so words like bow wow, splash, hiccup, we, you know, we talked about those words the other day in your phones. So let's look at indexical. Indexical is more difficult, no? Indexical is, so I, I do this, it's indexical because you can immediately, if it's pointing up there, <laughs> that's the meaning, the sign itself is already very obvious, very clear. Um, um, somebody's face, Somebody's face can have an indexical meaning to us. So somebody looks angry immediately, we don't need to, it, it, it causes something in us. It is an immediate signature. And it's also cultural, of course, Miles. It would, yeah, it's cultural because in some countries, depend. You know, some people like to laugh a lot, some people don't like to laugh. <laughs> so in some cultures, people smile a lot, some cultures, people don't. So the smile has a different meaning depending on the culture, you know. Um, a scowling face, no? So it's an index of displeasure. I mean, most people, most people in most cultures, if something is sour, they'll go like, they won't go, unless they want to trick you, unless there's something else going on. <laughs> but, but your face shows, so I don't need to know your culture to know when you go like, normally that means that it's something sour or disgusting, that's indexical. And remember that symbolic is human language. Why is the word house, maison in French, and why is it house in English? I mean, you can look at history of the language, but in a sense, it's arbitrary. There's no direct connection between the, the sound maison and the shape of the house. But in sign language, in sign language, in some sign languages, house is this. So then it becomes, that's an iconic. So that's what we'll talk about that tomorrow and Deborah. So, so sign language uses a lot of iconicity because you can kind of see, you know, and what is this? What do you think it is? Yeah, because it's iconic. We don't need to know. We kind of can, can guess what it is because it's kind of iconic, isn't it? 
So, so okay. Why, why am I, why, why am I, why would I want you to think about this at home and relax about it <laughs> and, and start thinking in, the, in these three terms? Because I think it's useful because in a sense, when people are asking us for a translation that is faithful, they have an expectation of a translation, normally we say formal, no, it keeps the form. They're looking for a form of iconicity. That probably doesn't exist, but they have been taught that it exists. And when they compare maybe English to a language that belongs to the same family as English, you can see certain syntactical similarities. So people are fooled to thinking, oh, if you can do it like that, you can do it in any language like that, syntax, you know? So, so. Symbolical then, mo most people want to, want, most churches and most church people are interested in a sense of iconicity. And, and when that is broken down, they accept another translation because they accept that you, you can now, you can dismantle <laughs> the form because it's not so much so important, the iconicity, let's say, um, if Greek, Greek uses participles, so I'm gonna force my language to use participles. <laughs> um, Greek uses participle, my language uses them, but not, not so often. I'm gonna force my language to use them as often as Greek, you know? Um, it's like in, it's like in translation of Spanish to English or English to Spanish, you know? Once I read, um, Somebody translated something from English to Spanish. And then in Spanish, the text read something like, yo, camino, yo, 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 it's I, yo, 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 yo. And I was thinking there's something weird about this text, but I couldn't, I didn't know what. I said this, everything was translated well, but I kept thinking this text is not well translated. There's something wrong with the text. I, then after two days, I realized what it was. You see, in Spanish, you don't need to make, make the subject, the agent, explicit. Because camino in Spanish is already saying that it's I, because of the verb um, conjugation. I mean, that's true for Italian too, and then Portuguese. So in English, you need to do it, because English is the language. English is actually the most well-known Creole language, I always say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in English you need to do it. English lost the, the or lost doesn't use the conjugation, the complex conjugation. So in English you need to you need to say you, I, we all the time. But in Spanish you don't. In Spanish when you do it too much, it's like you're putting a lot of emphasis on the I in this case. It becomes a very arrogant text. It becomes a very weird text. It's the same thing with Greek and Hebrew, of course. When people are translating and then the Greek doesn't make explicit the I. And when, when it's explicit, the ego, we know there's emphasis, you know. So, so it's the same kind of thing. So these, that's why it's important then. And when we go to performance, you see, when we go to performance, if you are going to judge a, 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 a performance to the, with the categories of writing, it's not going to work. <laughs> because the similarity will not be iconic in that sense, but you will find similarities um, in another way. For example, every time the writer, the writer has a way of speaking that every time something important is going to happen, um, the writer um, uses a certain phrase, you know? Um, therefore I tell you, or therefore Jesus said, un in, in John, the Gospel of John. What do you do with that? How do you, so if you're gonna perform, are you going to say that all the time? Are you gonna find other ways to do it, you know? Um, in, in, in The Godfather, the book, um, oranges play a very important role in the book. It is a light motif in the book. So what did uh, Francis Coppola do? If you, if you, if you, if you ever watch the Godfather movies, <laughs> if you watch the Godfather movies, the one, one and two, and the, the third one too, which is the less, lesser one, <laughs> you will notice that every time they're gonna kill somebody, somebody is eating an orange, or there is an orange on, at the table. You watch it again and <laughs> 
So, so, so the, 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 the filmmaker decided to find a visual way to bring this leitmotif to the attention of the of the one. But, in a, but maybe most people don't notice it. <laughs> but, but it's there, it's there. And, and once somebody tells you, you watch the movie, you'll see, you'll see, oh, there's an orange there. Even when the great, when the, when the, when the godfather himself, in this case, uh, Marlon Brando, <laughs> um, is dying in the yard, he's, he's, you know, he's gonna die, and his grandson is playing with him, and then you see the last thing that he does is he eats an orange, and he falls down of a heart attack with the orange in his hand. Every time they're gonna kill, everywhere somebody's gonna be killed, <laughs> they're talking to each other, they're gonna kill so-and-so, you, the camera goes and you see the oranges, you know, so. So, so that's a way to, to, to translate across science systems. Lighting, lighting can be used. So, so dark and light, it says something to us, you know? So that's, that's why filmmakers make very good use of that. Close up or a wide shot, you know? And in some, in some places they, they do the close up for a particular reason. They, they thought about these things, they, they really think about them. Um, so, Everything can be a sign if the human being wants it to be a sign. This thing is not a sign until I picked it up and told you it was not a sign. Yeah? Because the minute I picked it up <laughs> and said this thing is not a sign, it became a sign. It became a sign of an example of what I'm giving you <laughs> that is not a sign. You see? The minute the human being focuses his or her attention on something, the human being can make it into a sign. We can have a very complex way of communicating. We can communicate by sounds or by Morse code. We can communicate with our eyes. You know those famous spy movies where the guy is going. <laughs> and in that one, in, in those blinking, he's telling the whole story of what happened in the, the past one hour of the movie. <laughs> you know, because human beings can, can use signs. So, uh, so let's do something now. Um, let's, let's try, let's just do this. Why, why would this be iconic and this be symbolic? What, what do you think, why? And then I'm gonna leave this one for the last. Why, why would this here be, so this painting here, this illustration, why is it called iconic? So, so the sound is the English word heart. The written code is this, no? So we have different sign systems. <laughs> so we're saying heart, and we can write it down in English, and then we want to translate it. Yeah, we are translating it now in another sign system. So this now, we can do it in different ways. Some of these ways are appropriate, some of them are not appropriate. Let, let's look at this one. Why, why is it iconic? Why? Let's maybe say it now own words. Because it's, it's a picture of the heart. Yeah, it, it tries to draw the heart with all its uh, compartments, arteries, yeah. And this one? <laughs> this one is more difficult, isn't it? Yeah. Because we are so used to this one that we nearly think it's iconic. Yeah. But it... Isn't it hard? <laughs> it's what somebody trying. What somebody represented the shape. What somebody trying to represent the shape? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, because something can start as being an attempt at being iconic, yeah. and then turning out to be symbolic because nobody knows anymore <laughs> what the link is. It's the same thing with, with words, you know. A word is etym etymology, but at some point we don't know anymore. Yeah, yeah. But 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 yeah, yeah. I think I think probably it started started to be iconic, but. But nowadays you would say, well, this and this, well, it depends. If you think it, this resembles this, <laughs> well, uh, I don't know. In my country, it resembles love. But, but, uh, in your country, it's? Love. 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 So it stands not for the heart, but it stands for love. Someone sent you that one. It means he loves you. <laughs> Somebody sent you this one. <laughs> means he or she loves you. Okay. I, I, I like the, the exact description. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. In our church, yeah. we had a, a, a couple which we had to cancel for some time. Yeah. When uh, someone posted a, a good morning message with that, uh, yeah. it became a challenge in the couple. So, 
so we had to cancel. But <laughs> it was difficult. It was difficult too. Yeah, yeah. But but let's say at at a hospital. Or, or uh, um, you, you go there and they have this sign on certain stuff, you would imagine that nobody's loving nobody. Yeah, they're saying the heart. But, but you're right. So, so this is important for, for semiotics. The social context determines. That, that's why semiotations moved away from, you see, first semiotics started to analyze language and signs in themselves trying to find the truth about them. But that's why social simulations say, that's why people like Van Leeuwen, when you guys read that, they say, listen, actually the social context is what gives that sign its meaning in a much deeper way. So I always want to know, I always want to know the context. I always want to know who is seeing this sign, who gave the sign to who, in which social institution. It's different if it is in the church probably than if it is in the hospital. Yeah. The same sign changes, no? Okay. Now the indexical one. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. La dale che. Que adesso con noi. I don't know what that means. Boy. Oh. Ah, yeah, 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 I know what it is. It, it's something where you, where you, for Valentine, Valentine's Day, you are gonna give something to help people, um, children with um, um, blood cancer, I think, no? Yeah, yeah, so it, it's for sick children. It's children with cancer, yeah. But, but the heart says something about give from the heart, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. And also because now yeah. in social media, uh, if you check our WhatsApp, you see that it is different colors for that. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah sure. 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 Yeah, that's true. I mean, you wouldn't put a number in green unless you're Irish and it's St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> so a whole, a whole range of meanings come up, you know? Normally you put it in red, you know? Okay, this one is indexical. Why is it indexical? That's a, that's a difficult one. So why is it indexical? So, so indexical means that the sign, the cause of the sign you can immediately, in that context, they are so, they are not apart. Like symbolical, symbolical, they are totally apart because I can use language, I can conjure up things that we don't have here. No? Except for the um, deictic language. You, he, here. You need to be in the room to know who, who is you, <laughs> or who is he. You need to know the story, otherwise you won't. But why is this indexical? Yeah. Um, maybe the, I'm guessing, but uh, probably the doctor would look at that and said they would think that person is having a heart attack or some problem with their heart. Yeah, yeah, maybe having a problem with the heart. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but but why but why is it why is it such a direct sign and this one is not? Because the person is. It's pointing to their body, where, where may, may, maybe they don't have the heart in the, exactly the right spot, <laughs> in the location, but at least we know there's a heart pumping there, and actually they're pointing, and, and that's truth. It can mean different things depending on the situation. Maybe a heart attack, maybe it means I'm doing this from the heart. We don't, we don't see the face, <laughs> so we don't, yeah. we don't know. It's like, oh, I'm dying, <laughs> you know? Or, or you, said, you said something, oh, why you hurt me? Is it in pain? You think it's in pain? Yeah? <laughs> there's an element of convention to this, too. There is a big element of convention. Yeah, whereas with the smoke, the common example of smoke, I'm gonna, yeah. Here, it, it yeah. strips away that. People yes. ask a lot more, how is that conventional? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, because when, when you say the smoke, smoke and the smoke alarm, so the smoke alarm goes, the alarm goes off, it's indexical because the smoke causes the alarm to go off, which is a sign to you that there is smoke, there is fire. That makes it indexical because the, 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 the sign is immediately there what causes it. Yeah. yeah. In this case, if the person is having a heart attack, then it's very indexical. Because let's say I'm, I'm watching you from, <laughs> from afar, and I'm having a heart attack, but I cannot tell you. So I'm going, <laughs> so you know, you know, you might know. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. We know this though because of TV. Basically. We we know this, yeah. It's, it's a dramatization. If, if we would meet somebody that, that we're talking to and would never have seen a TV, we would go like this, would we know? That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> we actually had, had an ad in New Zealand at one which is teaching you about, you know, what are the extra symptoms when they have this. So they had somebody sitting on the bench and they say, you know, look how good the person having a heart attack. And there's this guy going, oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we are going to go to lunch. So the idea this morning is to have us think a little bit about different signs. Have us think about words, spoken words, written words, sign language, paintings, dramatization, films, and there's always a combination of signs. Because even when people were doing manuscripts, or in the medieval time for sure, when they were copying Bibles, they would put um, uh, illustrations, you know. Um, there's always this element where we do mix the different science systems. So the thing that we as consultants, the challenge for us is we are used to looking at text. And we are used to the monopoly of text to the degree where we have disembodied the text and made it into a thing on its own. While actually even a text needs embodiment. <laughs> but because of history and social culture, it has become a thing on its own. So when we are going to work now with orality, we're going to work with the Bible Society tells you, we're doing a comic, we're doing um, something here, just change the words, <laughs> just translate the words. <laughs> we already have the pictures. And as a consultant, we need to check that. If we're gonna check sign language, which is totally different, which is a, a, uh, something on its own, we need to ask different questions. We, we need to realize that the same questions we were asking when we're doing it with writing, now we need to find ways to transform those questions in meaningful ways for that medium. So, so, so in that medium, it's not necessary to say every time, I said, I said, I said, because I'm saying it. <laughs> so I can just speak. Yeah? So, so, so we need to find ways to analyze, to ask questions, and, and this is where, where Miles and some of you already mentioned, culture is so important to this. But it's the same thing with written translation too. We need to know the culture of the people who we are translating. You know, acceptability issues, meaning issues, semantic. So, so the thing about culture, it comes into play too with intersemiotic translation. And that is our challenge. And the more we do it, the more we read about it, and many people have thought about this for a very long time, but it's a change of mentality too. So now instead of looking at the text, now I need to hear, Dan said yesterday, no, let's hear the text, but now with sign language, let's see the text, but in performance, in performance as a combination of facial, space movement, tone of voice, all of those things come together. And our job will be to, as, we don't have to be experts in any one of them, but we need to slowly learn and find ways where we can ask meaningful questions to collaborate with those who are experts in that, where our job is to bring that biblical knowledge that we have, that knowledge of linguistics, that knowledge of, of, of social cultural issues, to bring that to bear so that we have well taught products that are not written. <laughs> At least we thought about it. Are they going to be good? Are they going to be perfect? No. But we all know that written translation also has its problem, don't we? So, <laughs> so the same issues that we face there, we're going to face here. In a different way, but the same issues. Thank you. Have a good lunch. Yeah.